Jessica, if, go ahead. <laughs> Jessica, if you were a close personal friend of Sarah O'Toole and you wanted to assist her, what would you say? Um, I would say... This should be on the tip of your tongue at any moment. I, I, I should be able to stop you on the street and say, Knights of Labor, snap my... Terrence Potter. Terrence Potter, Terrence Potter Lee is the, was the dominant leader of the Knights of Labor. Then I should be able to do this ways. I should be able to say, major confrontation involving the Knights of Labor, kind of. What do we associate the Knights of Labor with? What confrontation? Go ahead, Samantha. Um, Powderly Knights of Labor, Haymarket. Haymarket Square. Haymarket Square. What happened to the Knights of Labor? The Knights of Labor rose to 700,000 in membership. Powderly envisioned the organization that would unite all workers into one union that would promote these worker-producer cooperatives. By 1890, the whole thing is gone. Why is that, dear Emery? Ah, so we've got four things, a bomb, a square, anarchist, and radical. Correct, and all of those contributed to this. Yes, the Knights of Labor was associated with the Haymarket Square riot, which was associated with radicalism, which discredited that movement, and the Knights of Labor as a result of that, despite the fact that they really didn't have anything to do with it except those accused of being involved were members, the Knights of Labor was discredited and basically faded from existence. The most enduring union, the most enduring union, however, Shalai Lee, was what? Um, American Federation of Labor. The AF of L. And what name is tip of our tongues? Meredith, tip of our tongues. Who do we? Samuel Gompers. We like that name because it's unusual. Gompers. Sounds like a fish. You know, Gompers. Samuel Gompers. And we said that Gompers AF of L is more successful. How was the AF of L different? from the Knights of Labor. We remember that there were fundamental differences. Ellen, what differences do we recall from our interesting discussion in class? Do you recall? Differences between the AFL and the Knights. Pick one. There are numerous ones. Pick one. Go ahead, Ellen. Don't be afraid. Nothing will happen to you. All right, Jason H. U. Yes, the AFL was pra pragmatic. Go ahead, uh, Sarah. Ah, uh, so the fundamental. Well, go ahead, dear Meredith. Um, they want their main purpose as a whole. Yes, that's right. Now, I think that significantly, the you know the fundamental difference is the AFL had no desire to unite all workers in one union, whereas the Knights of Labor wanted to do that. The AFL basically wanted to help those who were best able to help themselves those that could do something. They were kind of militant in that they supported strikes, you know, um, and they were set up to strike, but their objectives were fairly conservative. They just wanted more within capitalism. They didn't seek to overthrow the system. Now, um, um, okay, we're good here, all right. Now, we, we talked about, you know, the, the growth of the labor organizations, we talked about the union movement, we talked about, um, you know, industrialization, and then we moved to urbanization. Right? We moved to urbanization. We said these are connected, right? Urbanization and industrialization are connected. Industries grew, and typically they grew in cities, right? Because of the railroads, resources could be brought together in central locations, and products could be manufactured requiring laborers, and this was one of the reasons that cities grew. Now, Nicole Morrow, we did argue this. Anytime there is a major demographic shift, anytime there is a movement of people, we can explain it with a push and a pull. Something pulled people into Gilded Age cities. Based on what we said just a moment ago, Nicole, what was the big pull into the Gilded Age cities? Um, both economic opportunities with jobs and Job. also the excitement of the city. Wow, you were very much paying attention because you're sitting right in front of me, and that helps, does it not? Um, economic opportunities with industrial jobs in the cities and then you know people businesses that emerged that sold to the people that worked in the factories you know this growth of economic opportunity as well as the excitement the lure the culture the entertainment the leisure the uh, the, the, the uh, sort of devices the the things that the city had to offer as opposed to the farm which which we kind of argued there was a push off of there was a push off of the farm and to some extent, that hopefully makes more sense based on what we've just been talking about. 
You know, we've just been talking about declining farm prices, how difficult it was for farmers to make it, how they felt, you know, very exploited, that there was a conspiracy against them, that they had to work harder with more equipment and more land to grow more crops to make the same level of income. You know, in conjunction with life being kind of drab and difficult, you can see how people started to leave the farms. They did. They left the farms. They went to the city. Autumn William Suggs, please report to the office. Autumn William Suggs to the office. All right. I've got to get myself another one. All right. Now, um, you can never have too many names. Now, we also said that not only did people leave the, the um, American you know, countryside to move to Gilded Age cities, they also left the European countryside. And we talked about the massive immigration that came to America, largely to cities during the Gilded Age. And we distinguished between the old immigrants and the no new immigrants, the first wave and the second wave. What was the big distinguishing factor made? What the first wave of immigrants, the old immigrants, what made them the old first wave of immigrants, and who were the new immigrants? Go ahead, Mabe, uh, fire away. Well, I mean, there were Chinese because remember, the Chinese um, were the first group to, to really be shut out. Um, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act is the first piece of legislation to really s signal out an ethnic minority for, for immigration restrictions. But uh, go ahead, Jason H. U. Uh, the old immigrants, they were usually from Western Europe and had money. Ah, uh, so he is saying, Samantha, that that first wave of immigrants immediately after the Civil War, 1865, up until the mid-1880s, were largely from Northern and Western Europe. Now, what countries are, are we talking about? We're talking about um, Northern and Western Europe. What countries are we talking about when we say Northern and Western Europe? Go ahead. England. England is, you know, Scotland, England, Ireland, Germany, uh, the Scandinavian countries, France. These were the traditional places that people had left to come to America from previously. The new wave begins about the mid-1880s, comes to full fruition in 1890, really accelerates after the turn of the century. Where are they from? Go ahead, Waze. Like Scandinavian countries? No, not as much. Oh, sorry, Scan not Scandinavian. Uh, countries like Poland. No, you could call those Slavic countries, Slavic. or you could call it, um, you could call that Southern and Eastern Europe. So Southern and Eastern Europe included, you know, countries like Poland, like, um, um, you know, the, the Hungarian Empire, Hungary, um, the Czech, um, Slovak, Slovenians, Crows, um, Serbians, Bulgarians, Russians, um, Italians, the Southern, and, and how were they different? How were these two groups different? We said they were, but how were they different? Yes? They were impoverished. Ah, so these groups coming from the South and the West, the second wave, tended to be poor. Their culture tended to be significantly different than American culture. And um, um, they tended to be Catholics and Jews. Often they weren't Protestants. They didn't have the same kind of sort of association with American culture that the British did, a linguistic connection. And so their um, assimilation, because of their large numbers, because of their poverty, they migrated to sections of cities where their assimilation was a lot slower. I mean, this, this is all kind of connected on some level. You know, the people thought, oh, these are dumb Polish people, dumb Italian people, dumb hunkies that come here. They can't assimilate into the larger culture. But there, there are kind of like logical reasons for this. One is so many of them came and they migrated to sections of cities where they were able to preserve their culture. Um, they were often impoverished and uneducated in their own kind of languages. So picking up, you know, picking up and reading and writing English certainly is going to take them longer. So I'm not sure that, that it was accurate to consider them somehow intellectually less capable than anybody else. But the handicaps that they had to overcome might have been more significant, and their settlement pattern might have slowed their assimilation into the larger culture. What's a bird of passage, incidentally? They mentioned this in your textbook, and how does it relate? Yes, go ahead. Um, someone who would come, usually a male, work for a few years and go back home. Then go back. All right, so a bird of passage.